these um, uh, political level points of progress um, meant almost nothing to the population on the ground, especially in the eastern er uh, provinces of Congo. And the reason for that is that even though you had um, the uh, armies of Rwanda and Uganda withdraw their troops, um, you had a shift from that international conflict to what was really a, a proxy war. And um, uh, on the one hand side, you had uh, the Rwandans um, now supporting the rebel movements in the Congo and the um, Congolese government supporting those same uh, Rwandan Hutu rebels, formerly part of the uh, genocide, now called the FDLR. We'll talk a little bit about them this morning. Um, and you had a conflict that sort of, as I um, kind of described before, in its initial uh, phases in the 90s was really about geopolitics um, shift into a war that was increasingly over control of these mineral resources. Um, so here uh, you have um, Laurent Nkunda, who was the uh, leader of the, uh, the Rwandan backed rebel group, the CNDP, we talked a lot about this morning. Um, and so uh, you had continuing conflict there and the sort of tendency towards these um, negotiations and integration of these rebel groups into the Congolese army, which kind of creates, uh, again, peace agreements that don't actually mean anything on the ground. Because what's happening on the ground is that whether you're a rebel or whether you're in the Congolese army and you used to be a rebel, your objective remains the same, which, although there, there are many of them, predominantly one is to profit from and control economic resources. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the role of the United States before turning it over to uh, Fatima. This is uh, Hillary Clinton out visiting Mr. Congo in uh, August of 2009. Um, looking back at the history of Congo, especially at that Cold War era, and then also um, during the conflict, the U.S. was sort of um, perceived to be, and, and in some cases supporting, uh, Rwanda and Uganda. Um, the history of the U.S. Uh, involvement in this part of the world um, has been more often than not been uh, more harmful than helpful. Um, and so there is a, that we, we got to sort of keep that history in mind, I think, as we now look at how can the United States play a positive and constructive role. Um, uh, right now, thanks to, frankly, <laughs> the, the legislation that was passed um, here in the United States, which was you know, uh, supported by grassroots efforts and by um, uh, leaders in Congress, um, the United States has kind of, uh, and thanks to Hillary Clinton's going out and actually kind of making commitments for the U.S. to do something positive, to do what it can to stop the violence um, in Eastern Congo, um, I think there's an opportunity for the U.S. to really play a leadership role in leading all of the efforts that we were sort of talking about in terms of how do you actually um, end this conflict. Um, but um, it's not going to be easy, um, and I think maybe I'll save a lot of that for um, the Q&A and for conversations that we're going to have, but as we're looking ahead, you know, there's a, we're going into uh, yet another election year in, in Congo. Um, the president, Joseph Kabila, has changed the law to make it much easier for him to be a, a elected. Um, you have a situation where all of the um, uh, where this legislation is coming into effect, and so there is economic pressure to change the way that the um, extraction of natural resources has been fueling the conflict, but also an enormous effort by all of the vested interests who've been profiting from those resources to find loopholes and to keep doing what they have been doing. And we can talk about how that plays into all of these conversations about bans versus um, uh, livelihoods and, and all of that, I think, during the Q&A. But um, I'll stop there for now. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Fatima, and I just want to, as I'm trying to load this uh, presentation, go ahead and thank the um, sponsors uh, for inviting me to speak on this, um, but also for all of you who are coming from different parts of the country. Um, I think
think it's awesome that you all live here. Um, and what I want to try and do right now um, is talk about this. Um, in the next 15 minutes, which is absolutely ridiculous, but try and provide an overview to this serious human rights um, violation in the DRC, which is uh, gender-based violence and that of sexual violence. But first I want to ground the conversation in understanding how violence is um, a, a part and parcel of society, particularly towards women. Um, and then exploring how and why the DRC is so unique and why it is dubbed the great capital of the world. And then um, explore some of the emerging trends that are um, coming through research and end by highlighting one proposed intervention which is particularly relevant for all of you today, which is um, relating to conflict within our population. Um, so violence against women is a universal um, and has persisted throughout human history. Um, during times of conflict or instability, sexual violence is particularly um, acute and particularly affects um, women and girls. And part of this has to do with the resulting breakdown of social networks um, and formal institutions that were constructed to protect women and children from this. Um, when we think of um, violence against women in conflict, we often associate it with genocide and ethnic, ethnic, cleaning, ethnic cleansing in Rwanda and Bosnia and Darfur, some would say too. Um, but it's also part of this uh, situation in DRC, and it's not just rape, it also encompasses sexual slavery, um, forced pregnancy, forced sterilization, assault, trafficking, forced sex work. It's just an unreasonable number of ways and forms that it can take. Um, and this is actually a picture of women who are at the Ponzi Clinic in um, DRC, in Eastern DRC. And what we see is that some of the women are actually pregnant, um, and that's a result of, uh, of, of their rape. Um, it's, rape has also been documented in other recent conflicts in Africa, such as in Liberia and Sierra Leone. And so what is it about DRC that makes it particularly egregious and particularly different um, from previous instances? Uh, this attention has, there's been a tremendous amount of attention on gender-based violence in DRC. It's gotten the attention of activists, all of you here today, researchers, um, policy makers, even celebrities. And so, I, you know, in 2008, the Security Council um, proclaimed in a resolution in 1820 that sexual violence poses a threat to peace and security. Um, in, in 2010, we saw Ban Ki-moon, the Secretary General of the UN, appoint um, a special representative on, sex, on sexual violence and conflict. And so clearly we're seeing that it's, it's a huge issue and, and what is it um, that's about DRC that's prompted this. Um, and so when you do research or when you do any type of um, background analysis on DRC, some of the two common phrases that you're gonna come across are rape capital of the world and rape as a weapon of war. When you think about sexual violence in DRC, it's arguably regarded as one of the worst situations in the world, both in terms of scale and brutality. Um, at this point, I want to issue a caveat that all the numbers that I'm going to be telling you right now um, should be taken with a grain of salt, because of the grain of salt, not a salt, <laughs> um, because it's difficult to get precise numbers on this. You are depending on, and the ethical thing to do is to count who comes forward. And in a, country, in a context where there's such stigma associated with reporting um, sexual violence, you, you have to realize that this is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, and also, in places of conflict, it is difficult to gather data because it's just too unstable and insecure for humanitarian organizations to reach. Um, and so, Despite this uncertainty, we do know that the UN has accounted um, 200,000 cases of sexual assaults from 1996. Um, and even though the war officially ended in 2003, um, in incidents of sexual violence has skyrocketed.